in case number 11, now pending before this tribunal. The group I was with, the Political Ministries Division, was interested in political ministers. Mm -hmm. Not only, you may recall at our trial, not only did we have about eight members of the foreign office, starting with <laughs> the State Secretaries von Weizsäcker and, and von Steengraf, von Moyland, but we also had the Minister of Agriculture, <coughs> Dare, <coughs> the Minister of Finance, Schwerin von Krosig, Peebus, uh, Stucker, uh, Dietrich, all men who were involved in the government, you might say. The gathering of evidence was a very difficult process. For example, in the <laughs> Foreign Office case, you had the files of the Foreign Office in Berlin, which were extremely voluminous. And we almost discovered a surprise of the day, you know, the evidence flowing in. And actually, the difficulty in part was that we as lawyers were not actually participating in the gathering of the evidence. And there was always the uncertainty whether you had all the evidence. Right. And in fact, our trial, which the 12th trial, <laughs> was a reprise of the first trial in many respects, but with much more evidence. We had more evidence than they did, and, and uh, more insight into what had actually taken place. The case was the largest, the longest, and the last of the post-IMT trials to be concluded. Uh, some 160 court sessions later, in 17 months, judgment was rendered. The total record Included counsel briefs, ran to 79,000 pages. Uh, judgment itself consisted of 692 pages. How do you keep track of all of this? It's a massive undertaking. You have to be so conversant with the subject matter, and you as a lawyer would appreciate that. But after you get immersed in one of these big cases, <coughs> you uh, really are amazed at the amount of information that you were able to mop up. Right. And, uh, and I think the fact that a number of us were younger, uh, but guided with mentors who were much senior, we were assisted by the head of the legal department of the German Foreign Office, Dr. Friedrich Gauss. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gauss was an amazing individual. He was a, a legendary figure. He uh, had been head of the German Foreign Office Legal Department since the early days of the Weimar Republic. Right. He was the father, I am told, of the Locarno Pax in 1925, okay. in which Germany entered into bilateral treaties of non-aggression and also agreements to arbitrate with many of the European powers. Right. And when you and this was shortly after the shackles of the Versailles Treaty had been imposed, Hitler was just rising to power at the time. When the Weimar Republic fell, Dr. Gauss like many of the That's career true. diplomats, uh, no. just kept coming to the office, so to speak. Right. And he served Hitler, uh, well, von Ribbentrop. He was not a Nazi, he was a functionary. Right. And very able. He was the author of the actual draft of the Non-Aggression Pact of 1939. Oh, no kidding. He had gone with von Ribbentrop to Moscow. 
In fact, I had a picture for a long time of the signing of that non-aggression pact. I have it here, in which von Ribbentrop, Molotov, and Stalin, I think Stalin is sitting at the table signing the pact, or Molotov and Stalin standing, von Ribbentrop. Somewhat, much later, in fact, within recent years, someone sent me another picture, which was larger. That had been a cut picture. And standing next to von Ribbentrop was Dr. Gauss. No, we darn. He and I became very good friends. Uh, he was persuaded by Kempner, once Nazis had fallen, to more or less become our chief resource on the foreign office case, particularly the wars of aggression. So he and I worked very intimately, and I used to go to take him to our movies. They had films there, and he used to love Western movies because he, he liked the scenery, you see. And he was of invaluable assistance to us. He worked, Kempner dominated him, I must say that. But he was used to being dominated. He had a, a technician's uh, delight in going ahead with the project, but uh, not a, in a very self-effacing way. And once he came over to us, he was as loyal strange as it may seem, as he had been to the Weimar Republic and to the Nazi regime. Because he was never a Nazi, as so many of the uh, members of the Foreign Office were. They, they were not Nazis in the sense of uh, uh, sharing their philosophy or their uh, inclinations to seize power and retain it in brutality. But it was his duty to serve the fatherland. And he was a great help to us. He pierced the arguments, in our case, with many of the <coughs> uh, dependents. And he would also tell us where evidence might be found, the reliability of so-and-so, and so forth. So he worked very closely with us throughout the case. And this change in the posture of the Western world, particularly in the United States, after the first trial, which greatly influenced the subsequent trials, and is, uh, I think, uh, vital to uh, consider that because mm -hmm. that was the framework in which the other uh, trials took place. And as the trials progressed, the pressures increased almost uh, exponentially. At the first trial, there was tremendous support in the victorious nations of the world and in those nations that had been freed were the trials. And uh, Mr. Jackson's stature and position and brilliance of presentation embellished uh, the entire trial. However, <laughs> one of the salient arguments during the trial, as I had mentioned earlier, was the Germans' contentions that the Russians were the real foe, mm -hmm. and that we were foolish in having stopped them from destroying communism. <laughs> and that argument at first trial seemed to be sour grapes, perhaps, to some extent, since they had <laughs> 
been unsuccessful in their quest. Although they were really of the feeling that if there had been no second front, that they would have won. I'm not sure that's the case, but certainly a good argument could be made for it. And it was their belief. With the death of Roosevelt, and Truman's coming on, and then the atomic bomb, you started to have a change. And in our Congress, uh, isolationism, which had always been strong in the late 30s and early 40s, in fact, President Roosevelt had had to maneuver <laughs> to supply aid to Britain and the other allies in the years before we entered the war. There was a resurgence of that. Also, there seemed to be a general loss, gradual but increasing, of public interest in the trial. Hungary, I was personally involved because we were very interested in Admiral Horthy testifying, and we, and we were unable to get him to do that at first. And so I was finally able to go out to see him. He, was, he had been held under house arrest in Germany since 1944 when he was deposed by Hitler when he refused to send Hungarian Jews to the east in Auschwitz. <laughs> and I managed, I, he was interestingly, and I'm not sure geographically where it was, but he was in a very fine chalet in the in a forested area, some distance from Nuremberg. And I went out there and I remember walking in and there was a very narrow entranceway, but long, and on each side of it were the little horns of deer. There must have been hundreds of them, because this was a hunting lodge. Right. <laughs> and uh, apparently this was one of the great hunting preserves. And I met with him and his very charming uh, daughter-in-law, who had been this wife of Horthy's son. And Horthy's son was a colonel in charge of the Imperial Guard in Hungary. And when the SS attacked the castle to take Horthy prisoner, the Imperial Guard resisted and his son was killed in that mm -hmm. action in 1944, I believe. And I enjoyed being with Horthy. He was very, very interesting and very charming and very gracious. He was of the old world school. <laughs> and I stayed with him about four or five days and finally persuaded him to come to Nuremberg and he did testify there. And <laughs> in fact, I had the pleasure of presenting him oh, wow. at our trial. In effect, we were told to try and get, this was particularly after the beginning of the Berlin blockade in June of 1948, let's end the trials. And there was an effort made to not have a trial. And uh, General Taylor, Telford resisted very strongly and we were supported by Lieutenant General Clay, who was the military governor. <coughs> and Truman was fairly supportive, but mm -hmm. he was caught in the crossfire of the need to uh, uh, reshape our foreign policy, which was definitely hostile <coughs> to Russia. And Truman did not have any close ties to Stalin, so that the long association that Roosevelt had didn't carry over. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and that was the reason, after our trial was 
11, the high command case followed us, but the high command case was shorter, which we concluded about October 1948, if I remember correctly. And our trial did not end until the verdict on in April, April of 1949. Case number 11 started in November 1947. Yeah. And yeah. we yeah. indicted so some 23. Mm -hmm. Main defendant among the diplomats was the Secretary of State, number two man, Deputy to Ribbentrop. A very controversial and in fact noble figure in some ways, Baron Ernst von Weizsäcker. He was State Secretary and he was succeeded in 1943 by Baron Steengrafen Moyland when Weizsäcker became the German ambassador to the Holy See. <laughs> then the Reich Minister in Chief of Hitler's Chancellery, which was a very important figure, Hans Heinrich Lammers. Lammers yeah. And you have a picture of Lammers. There, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. But I have some pictures much later, and he was much more satanic. That picture of him was when he was a very young man, mm -hmm. and he's barely recognizable. At the trial, he was hunched over. Uh, his face was lined with evil wrinkles, and he was a malevolent person, but very important. Right, oh, absolutely. Uh, another, Paul Kerner was another of the defendants. See, these were all ministry people. Hermann Goering's all-powerful deputy in the four-year plan, and he was on the Central Climbing Council of three during the war with Speer. SS Lieutenant General Gottlieb Berger, he was a close intimate of Heinrich Himmler, the Reichsführer SS, and uh, who had committed suicide mm -hmm. before the trials, and he was also the SS chief of prisoners of war and head of the SS main office, and he was liaison to the occupied territories which included Rosenberg and the Russian areas. The reason I mention some of these, if our trials had taken place and concluded at the time of the first trial, many of these men would have been sentenced to death, right. and rightfully so. Otto Dietrich was Hitler's press czar, and he was a, a very close intimate of Hitler. He was as powerful as Goebbels, although it was not publicized, because he controlled the press, <laughs> and Goering and others would look to Dietrich for most of the PR work. Goebbels controlled the radio, entertainment, propaganda, but not the press. Right. Although technically Dietrich was a subordinate, but he was a subordinate who had the right hand of uh, Adolf Hitler on his shoulder. And he was stationed with Hitler. In fact, it's interesting, this little biographical piece here, it said, after Hitler murdered many of the SA leaders in the brutal blood purge of 34, Dietrich described the Fuhrer's shock at the moral degeneracy of the old comrades he had butchered. When Hess flew to England, Dietrich reported his death in an accident over enemy territory. Even as the Russians were winning on the Eastern Front, Dietrich continued to assert that the Soviet Union is finished. Yes, and he was very powerful. He should have been the defendant rather than Pritchett. Pritchett. It was a, a grave mistake. Right. He was much higher and much more involved, and he would have been sentenced to death. As I mentioned, Schwer and von Krosik, who was a very distinguished old-time German aristocrat, he was the Reich Minister of Finance. 
and with him were the presidents of the Reichsbank, Emil Pugh, and Karl Rocha of the Dresdner Bank, and they were Pugh of the Reichsbank was involved in the collection of gold from Auschwitz mm -hmm. and other places. <coughs> And Paul Pliger, the industrialist who was chairman of the mining and steel works <coughs> and chairman of the huge Reichs <coughs> complex, the Hermann Goering works, was our industrialist. These uh, defendants had been selected. At the time, as I mentioned, there, there had been pressure to close down the trials in November of 1947 when we started. Before that, Telford had to make some very difficult choices because it was contemplated, that I think, that there would be three trials, each separate, and for example, the ministry's trial would not have had people like Plyger, uh, Gottlieb Berger, uh, possibly Stuckart, and Diet well, Dietrich probably, but it would be concentrated mainly on the Foreign Office and other ministries like the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, economists, bankers, military men were excluded <coughs> The <clears throat> and Telford finally, with whoever else made the choices with him, and I'm sure key members of his staff, uh, like Sprecher and uh, Kempner, in possibly consultation with <clears throat> our State Department and military governors, finally had to choose and squash this group into one trial. Actually, during the case, except for reasonably close coordination, we had two cases going. Really? The Political Ministries Division uh, handled its defendants, and the Economic Division handled its defendants. Okay. And. Uh, and the general oversight over that was done by Taylor and Trek Sprecher, who was then deputy to Taylor. And the political ministries division continued to be headed by uh, Bob Kempner. And I think there were a couple of fellows who alternated as head of the economic division. So those cases were coalesced. While we were in the midst of our own presentation after the case got rolling, <coughs> the pressures were greatly compounded by the declaration by Russia that Berlin would be blockaded. This occurred in June of 1948, and I think on June 23, although I'm not sure of the date exactly, 1948, Truman declared that we would not accept the blockade and we would begin the Berlin airlift. <laughs> and it was in this tumultuous time, with pressures also arising from now groups that had organized after the first trial. There was the Stahlhelm group of veterans, particularly of the wars, mm -hmm. and other veteran groups. There was another group of SS personnel, particularly the Waffen-SS, and there was a third leading group of leading German nationalists. And they kept in putting pressures on the military governor to get the trials over with. And it was particularly difficult when we chose some of the defendants, for example, von Weizsäcker. He was 
an extremely highly regarded figure, and it was a difficult prosecution. He uh, had a distinguished career. He had been uh, in World War I as a naval officer and liaison to one of the most distinguished admirals who was at the Battle of Jutland. Then he joined the Foreign Office and had been in diplomatic posts in Switzerland, Bern, before that I think in Basel. He'd been ambassador to Norway and an ambassador to Switzerland before he came into the German Foreign Office. <laughs> and he was head of the political division of the German Foreign Office in about 1937 when the preparations for the aggression against Austria started. <laughs> When von Ribbentrop came in in February 1938, replacing von Neurath, Baron von Neurath, who had been of the old school, you finally had at the head of the Foreign Office an out and out Nazi with no real diplomatic experience uh, or, or social position, despite the von, which was had been acquired by marriage. Right. Uh, <laughs> so there was a gulf. There was no doubt in the German Foreign Office that they were not Nazis, most of them. But they were nationalists. <laughs> this made the trial uh, exceedingly difficult. Among the witnesses called by Van Weizsäck uh, was the head of the Norwegian resistance movement, uh, who was a bishop. Uh, also, the bishop, I think, of Chichester, England, testified in his behalf that he had fought for maintaining peace, that he was a resistance leader. Uh, Lord Halifax gave an affidavit praising him. Is that right? <laughs> and the Vatican sent uh, a monsignor to testify in his behalf. So, with the change in political uh, fortunes and uh, it really looked as if war was inevitable. And we were working in this atmosphere, and we were aware of all this, the pressures from various right-wing individuals in Congress particularly, the pressures from the press, a criticism of the first trial by people like Luce and Robert Taft, who said it was ex post facto law, particularly the wars of aggression. It made it a most interesting challenge. This was one of the high notes. In fact, we went beyond the first trial. In the first trial on the aggressive war count, the indictment did not consider that the conquests of Austria and Czechoslovakia were crimes against peace. They said they were acts of aggression. So that during the decision in the first trial, the court noted time and again that these were aggressive acts, that these were uh, acts that were clearly meant to conquer these uh, small nations, either by overpowering them with threats or by force if necessary. But as they said in the first trial, 
there was no charge in the indictment right. that these were crimes against peace. So that any conquest before September 1, 1939, when war broke out, uh, was not within their jurisdiction. They act, the first trial acted under the London Charter of August 1945. However, Council Law Number 10, which was the successor in December of 1945, expanded the definition of crimes against peace to explicitly state included invasions. And that was the cornerstone on which we very proudly hung our hat. Now, there were three other trials that had tried to uh, convict the particular defendants of aggressive war. The Krupp case, the Flick case, and one involving the generals. Mm -hmm. In all three cases, the tribunals, in one case I think with a dissent, uh, said industrialists and military men who were the, the particular defendants were not high enough or deeply enough involved in the establishment of policy to uh, be found guilty, even though they were clearly involved within the definitions of preparing, planning, initiating, and waging aggressive war. So when we came to our case, except for the first trial, we had a very empty plate on that count. And we established two things. One, for the first time since the first trial, this last trial, which was sort of another IMT trial found defendants guilty of aggressive war. For example, uh, Paul Kerner was clearly guilty, Goering's deputy in Houtso, Lammers, the Reich Chancellery uh, was also guilty. Right. Uh, and Kepler the German Foreign Office, and Weizsäcker like and Vermin. And we were delighted with that, of course I was. A particular sense of history, I knew it all along. And it, in court, it was quite dramatic. One of the most dramatic moments was what led to the conviction of Weizsäcker on uh, aggressive war counts. We had very little evidence that we could really point to that would establish his culpability in the uh, helping, preparing, and planning the wars of aggression. And he contended that he was a member of the resistance. And there was a small resistance group, primarily in the office of Admiral. Canaris uh, intelligence officers. But the resistance group in Germany was not like the resistance group in, say, France. This was a group within the government of extreme nationalists who, on three or four occasions, were active against Hitler. And one was, just before Munich, you may recall, uh -huh. there was a, a, a definite plot to remove Hitler. The reason being the German military knew correctly that they were no match for the Czechs at that time behind the little Maginot line in south, in south uh, Eastern Czechoslovakia, Sudeten Deutschland. And the only thing that prevented them from acting 
was the Munich Pact, which, to their astonishment, they were handed the entire country on a platter. And uh, so the resistance movement ebbed and flowed depending upon the success of Germany. Weizsäcker, during the trial, said, I think it was during the trial, was not a Nazi, nor just a civil servant. His first duty was to the fatherland. And like so many of the German so-called non-Nazis who cooperated closely, mainly from the upper classes, uh, they were fervent nationalists. Interestingly, as you know, Weizsäcker was represented by four counsel. He was the only one to have an American counsel, Warren McGee, from Washington, D.C., whom he had specially petitioned for. His lead counsel was Helmut Becker, who was an excellent, really fine attorney and also a very impressive non-Nazi type. And then he had two assistants who historically were interesting. One was Sigismund von Braun, whose brother was Werner von Braun, a rocket specialist. Sure. And they were about my age. The other one was, I mean, von Braun was. And the other one was Richard von Weizsäcker, who was son of the defendant and who later became president of Germany. Yeah. So you can see how difficult it was to try von Weizsäcker. We were, took the position that despite their personal dislike of Nazis and their excesses, that they were fervent nationalists proud to see the shackles of Versailles removed, and that they served well and ably. Hitler could not, as the Jackson emphasized, and as the IMT held, have accomplished what he did without the help of many diplomats, military men, intellectual, educational people, the military officers themselves were split to some degree. And, of course, German aggressions could not have been successful without the very able foreign policy of the foreign office of dissembling, persuading, which led to the Munich Pact which led to them standing aside in the Ruhr and then when they invaded Austria. <laughs> so we did establish at the trial that the invasions of Austria and the invasions of Czechoslovakia were wars of aggression, crimes against peace. <laughs> that war of aggression. <clears throat> and in essence, the court held that a nation does not have to uh, resist when the force against it is overpowering. And a very fine description of what that entailed was given by the witness Rod Loba, who was the daughter of the then president of Czechoslovakia, mm -hmm. and uh, after the Munich Pact, which Hitler said was the last of his desires, and Chamberlain assured people about peace in our time, Hitler had already prepared in case, I think it was case Green, Green for the absorption of the rest of Czechoslovakia. And he put pressure through the Foreign Office on 
Hungary, for example, to support it. And he promised them Carthro-Ukrainian portion of Czechoslovakia. He put pressure through the Foreign Office on Father Tiso to declare the independence of Slovakia and make it a protectorate of Germany and dismember the rest of Czechoslovakia. And as Mrs. Radlova testified, she and her father were summoned to uh, Berlin at midnight. He was quite frail and elderly, and he was confronted there by Hitler, who loved to work at night. Hitler was a night person. And very, and an assemblage of other military national figures, including von Ribbentrop and von Weizsäcker. And that was the time that Hitler said, in effect, uh, we, I have given the order for the German troops to march into Czechoslovakia. <laughs> if you wish to avoid bloodshed, you will sign this document inviting right. us in to protect you, to protect them against them. And Goering, as he admitted at the trial, the first trial itself, threatened to destroy Prague from the air completely. And this was no idle threat as the later destruction of Warsaw showed. <laughs> so the tribunal held that these were uh, crimes against peace. And this was a landmark decision which went beyond what the IMT had. <laughs> January of 1940, <coughs> the St. James Declaration was issued by the governments in exile of those countries in Europe that had been overrun by the Nazis and whose people were being subjected to the utmost in suppression and brutality. Those nations' governments said after the trial they wanted a record written and the rule of law, which the Nazis would never apply, imposed and that they did not want more or less a killing of the leaders out of hand and just forgetting about the situation. Mm -hmm. And the legacy, I think, of Mr. Justice Jackson, who was the most towering figure to come out of all the trials because his words will live in international law and history. But he had a genius for inspiring the best <coughs> in people as far as their aspirations and vision. And uh, I think the legacy in part is that victors can apply a rule of law. Now it's been argued by many, not only German nationals but also uh, a lot of people in this country with hindsight as they sit on their backsides that it's Victor's justice. The fallacy of that is that if Hitler had won there would be no questions. There would be no justice. There would be no rule of law. No one in Germany has ever challenged, none of the defendants ever challenged the fairness of the trials that they did not have adequate counsel. Each had at least two. Weizsäcker, for example, had four. They had the best minds. They had an open trial with a free press reporting every incident, pouring over every document. There were no secret documents. There was no secret trial. This was law at its supreme high 
it was the first time that an international trial had been held that was on uh, questions of world interest. And as Mr. Jackson himself said, you know, what we write large today, we will be judged by tomorrow with his, the poison chalice. And it was very true. And so the legacy is that those, oh, there were two points that were entailed in that. They had to, previously, the defense of many in government, officials of government who had committed alleged crimes, such as aggressive war, brutality, was that these were acts of state. <laughs> and that <coughs> you tried a state, like Germany, but you didn't try individuals and hold them accountable as long as they were acting within the scope of their duties. And Nuremberg held that there would be individual accountability that each dictator and each dictator's significant followers would be held accountable as they are today and have since Nuremberg. That was a very important part of mm -hmm. the legacy. It also reflected the fact that I said time and again that international law is intrinsically political in character, as you're dealing between entities, states, and states are represented by individuals, but the class is between America and China or whatever. And therefore, for international law to contribute to peace, mankind's, so humankind's peace, you have to have a tribunal like the Permanent International Criminal Court where people who are individually accountable will have to answer for their crimes to an extent, and only to an extent, it's a deterrent. But it also is a landmark and milestone for the future. And in order for that to happen, you have to have the political will to desire the rule of law.